Um, but for me personally, I was like, this this is me. I remember when I told my mom and I said, hey, I just want to make sure you know I'm polyamorous. And she said, what's that? And I said, well, I just, I can date multiple people. I believe I can love multiple people. I can have connections with multiple people. And she was like, oh yeah, I couldn't see you any other way. And that was it. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their fascinating stories. We strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy approach to non-monogamy. However, it's important to remember that everyone does it a little bit differently, and the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we produce this show for entertainment purposes only. Please be aware that we aren't doctors or therapists. Consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy! Welcome to episode 138. We're Finn and Emma, and today we have an interview with Sharita Marie, I guess I should say. Sharita Marie. Yeah. <laughs> she is amazing. She is the co-organizer of Poly Dallas Millennium, which is a conference going to be held virtually this November, as well as the lead for Black and Poly Dallas. Yeah. And links for both of those are in the show notes. And beyond that, she obviously has her own story of exploring non-monogamy. And this interview and discussion with her is amazing. She talks about dating asexual partners, having mismatched libidos, uh, as you'll see, she she loves all the sex. Uh, yes. <laughs> and uh, dating and finding new partners during COVID, uh, raising kids to be open-minded and sex positive, as well as really taking care of yourself and self-care. So it's a great, great interview, and we're super excited to be bringing her back. Actually, she was on the panel discussion we did a few weeks ago yeah, about she was black on the, and polyamory. She was on the State of the Union panel discussion that came out uh, episode 133 with a bunch of other people. So go check that episode out as well. Absolutely. So uh, before we jump into the interview with her, we just wanted to go over a couple of community announcements. We're going to keep it short this week, short and sweet. We promise to try. Well, because you're sweet. <laughs> so... As you know, we are trying to build community. Hopefully all of you are trying to build community, especially through COVID. This is a difficult time and we want to try to build as much community virtually. So part of, we're doing that in two ways. One is doing our monthly meet and greets, which are virtual, of course, and then also through Patreon. And if you want to learn more about Patreon, stick around to the end of the episode. We're going to talk about it in the outro. But for right now, we're going to start with just the meet and greets. So we've been doing a monthly meet and greet. We've been we've done four of them now, and they've been fantastic. Each month, we get a couple more people, new people, and people have been they've been loving them. We get a little better each month too. Yeah, they get, <laughs> the last one was awesome. So we uh, they are open to everyone, not just Patreon members. They're ten dollars, and you can sign up on our website by going to the meet and greet tab. And our website is normalizing non monogamy. Dot com. Just in case you forgot. And there are links in the show notes below to take you right there. Uh, we are going to play really quick some a little testimonial from a couple of the people who were on the last one, how much they loved it, and then we'll see you guys in about 20 to 30 seconds. I just want to say that these things are fantastic. I really love meeting really interesting people all over the country and having a great time when we can't meet up in person. This is the next best thing. I'll also go with what he's saying. You know, I agree that this is definitely the next best thing to a uh, meeting. But for my first experience, definitely awesome. I definitely see there's a wide variety of people that are just like me. So it really made me feel like I'm hanging out with a bunch of my friends. And which is strange for the first time uh, feeling that way. So I look forward to the next one. Thank you so much for both of you for speaking up and telling us how much you enjoyed the meet and greet. Yeah, and I think one of the things that really stuck out was how awesome it is as an event for new people who have never explored anything like this. Uh, this was really his first event and first time really diving into this, and he felt like it was a bunch of his friends. So that's what we're trying to do, and we hope that you would uh, maybe take a look and possibly join us. Our next one. Is August 22nd. It's a Saturday. It's going to be at 10.30 p.m. Eastern because we want to make sure that the West Coasters can join as well. Yeah. So, again, August 22nd, 10.30 p.m. Eastern. And just to be really clear, because we didn't say this up front, what we do during these meet and greets is everyone comes into the Zoom meeting. We have a few icebreakers, get to know people a little bit, and then we give you a question and you're set off into 
breakout rooms and you get to meet these different people for a few minutes and talk about the question and then you're brought back and rinse and repeat. So we'd love to have you join us. Again, go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com, the meet and greet tab to sign up. And really quick before we jump into the show, we wanted to say a special thank you to our sponsor, Alt Playground. Uh, We've been working with them the past few months to help uh, bring you, the listeners, and people exploring non-monogamy the most diverse and inclusive way to meet other people. And we use it ourselves to meet people, and they are really pushing the boundaries of inclusivity. And that's why we love them. That's why we support them. And we're excited to be helping do that. Yes. And they're actually merging with some other sites as well. So if you've ever heard of Sexy Mofo or Social Swinger, nope, Swinger Social. (laughs) They might buy Social Swinger too someday. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) Both of those are merging into Alt Playground family. And if you are a past member of those sites, you get to be provided with a trial membership of Alt Playground. So don't worry, you're still going to be included. Yeah, I think the takeaway here is that they're growing, they're expanding, and they're really doing everything they can to to make a fantastic experience. If you want to check it out and join, you can go to our website, again, normalizingnonmonogamy.com, go to the resources tab. There are links there, or you can go straight over to altplayground.net and sign up and check it out. And I think that's it for right now. Let's go jump in and talk to Sharita. Other than, please reach out to us, say hello. (laughs) We just wanted to tell everyone that you can always reach out, say hello, and perhaps even come on the show yourself. Again, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Go to the Contact Us page, send us a voicemail or an email. We'd love to hear from you. And now let's go talk to Sharita Marie. Let's go. Welcome back to the show, Sharita. Thank you for taking time out of your evening. And we we were just talking a little bit before this that as people are going to find out here in a minute, we really don't know how you have time to be talking to us, but we're super grateful that you found time. So thank you. And yeah, welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Fun time. Yeah, yeah. Well, do you mind introducing yourself for anybody who maybe didn't hear the roundtable panel discussion that we did a few weeks ago? Absolutely. So I am Sharita Marie. I'm located here in Dallas. As far as non-monogamy goes, I am the co-organizer for Poly Dallas Millennium. Um, which is a uh, polyamorous conference that's held here annually in Dallas. I am also the um, Black and Poly Dallas lead. So I host our quarterly events. So whenever COVID goes away, we'll go back to having those quarterly events. Um, I sit on the Buy Plus um, Advisory Council for Out and Equal, representing my company. Um, so pretty excited about that as well. And I'm like super fun and I'm cute. Ah, yes. yes. <laughs> Most definitely. We're, yes. I'm so glad you pointed that out. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I didn't want any confusion. So. No. no, no, none at all. And again, thank you for being here and for all the work you do, um, the organizations you're part of and that you've, the work you've created. So yeah, thank you. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, so you're non-monogamous, we presume. Um, well, she sits on all those boards and yeah, does she's all those just things. she's just an she's an imposter. She's a, she's, I'm just an ally, just an ally. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess do you mind taking us back in time? How you came to be exploring non-monogamy and maybe what it kind of looks like for you? Absolutely. So, interestingly enough, it probably started in high school. Um, I thought something was wrong with me um, because I was okay. Like the people I was talking to was talking to somebody else. Um, You know, like like normal high school messiness. I'm gonna be like, oh, girl, you know, he's talking to so and so, and I'm like, oh, okay. I'm talking to somebody over here. Um, and then I would be like dating people and I would tell them like, Hey, I'm a free spirit. So like, if you don't want to know, don't ask me. And I remember I was like 16 or 17 and my boyfriend at the time worked at Taco Bueno and he called me and was like, you know, so-and-so just came in here and I said, they saw you at so-and-so at the mall. And I was like, okay, but like, I don't understand <laughs> what you mean. And he was just so upset. And I was like, yeah, I was there. Like, what's the issue? So I thought at first I was going to have to like hide and be sneaky. So I was like, well, maybe I'll just never do relationships. Right. So I did the whole free spirit thing. And honestly, um, I kind of got into the swinger thing when I was maybe like 20, when I was in college. Um, Cause that just made sense. Okay. These people don't want any strings. Um, but I think that I was looking for more than just the no strings attached, right? Sex. Um, that was great. Don't get me wrong. I'm pro ho. So <laughs> that works for me. Um, 
but I wanted something like a little bit different. So I would have to say maybe like six years ago is when I stumbled across polyamory. Maybe like a little bit before that. But I think around six years, I was like, yeah, that's me. That's right. that's what I am. So When you were exploring the swinging, were you doing that as a solo person or were you with a partner that you guys were like, hey, we're going to let's go see what this is about? So both. But the problem in the beginning for me, like when I had a male partner, is that he had that whole OPP thing and um, not wanting me to be, be with any other men and that's not allowed. And then um, I'm bisexual, very, very, very bi. And it was like, oh, if I'm with a girl that he would be, you know, be able to be with a girl too. So he just wanted all the threesomes. And that seemed like, so like unfair. <laughs> oh, I didn't want no parts of that. Um, so then I was solo, um, which I did like. Um, except every once in a while, I'd probably get like the couples who were doing the unicorn honey. And I was like, no, leave me alone. Like I'm trying to block that. Um, and then I, I was partnered again and that went pretty well actually. So, and I guess, are you willing to maybe talk a little bit about exploring swinging at a really early age? Cause that's something that, that we we've done. I mean, we got into this when we were in our early twenties, some of us in our late teens. Uh, but, um, <laughs> The it's a little bit of a different world, right? A lot of times you hear swingers are like, we're starting this, we're 40s or 50s and we're the kids are out of the house and now we're going to go try this. But it's a little bit of a different experience when you're 20 or 21 or early 20s. It yeah. is. It is. So there, there was like an on-premise swingers club here in Dallas and um, it was a really like mixed kind of crowd, like age, race, ethnicity. And I came across it because my partner at the time was really interested in threesomes. And I was like, eh, I want to do that. But like, maybe if we can get somewhere like an event that he can do what he wants to do, I can do what I want to do. And um, it was, it was fun. It was really fun. Like people were really welcoming. They were really, really friendly. And so I start, I, you know, I started kind of doing that more of the club atmosphere. But then, you know, people like you, they start adding you to like Yahoo group. This is how long ago this was, right? <laughs> so yeah, I'm like, I'm really not that old, but I feel like it when I mentioned Yahoo groups. So they would add me to the Yahoo groups and then um, there'd be like hotel parties. And I was like, ooh, hotel parties. Hotel parties were completely different because there's no socializing and dancing. It's like, oh, we in here to get it in. <laughs> and so um, I remember I went to a few parties and I would just sit on the couch because I'm a voyeur. I love to watch. So I was good. But I would like wrap myself in a blanket. It was like my don't touch me shield. And then I would just like watch. Um, and then eventually I was like, hey, I'm here. <laughs> so <laughs> let's, let's get it in too. Um, <laughs> but that was fun. But I met some really good friends, like some really good connections. So the whole um, thought process of, hey, no strings attached worked on, on, on it works. It works like I'm not going to have sex and then expect you to marry me kind of a thing. Right. Um, but I met some good friends and some business partners. And so it was pretty chill. I enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. And, and then I, I would travel. Oh, I would travel. So I went to Hedo. I used to go to Hedo 3. Hedo 3 was so much better than Hedo 2. Then I got rid of Hedo 3. And now there's just Hedo 2. And so um, then I would I went to like a club in Chicago and I would go to D.C. Like I would tra- there was like a travel group and I would travel with them. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Both, well, and- both alone as a single woman and also with with um, partners too. It yes. sounds like yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. That's awesome. It sounds that like your experience then early on was overall really positive for your for your relationships and just for your um, confidence level too. Definitely for my confidence level. Sharita likes a lot of attention. <laughs> <laughs> just putting that out there. Um, I will say that for my relationships overall, it was okay. I, I still sometimes with some of the partners I had would see the jealousy, see the frustration, see the, they're, they're non-monogamous right now, but wanting more of a monogamous situation. And me always saying, Hey, I'm a free spirit. You knew this when you met me. Um, and not really sure how that was going to turn out. So yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess, I mean, it happens at all stages of life, but especially early on, you know, when you're only in your early twenties, you're still trying to figure out a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I was just trying to figure out making some money and finishing my master's degree. I don't <laughs> know. What <laughs> Having some fun on the side. <laughs> exactly. So it worked out really good. I remember I graduated undergrad and I was in school full time. I'm um, getting my MBA and working. I didn't have time for a relationship. And so the swinger events just kind of worked out in my favor. Yeah. Well, and then can you talk a little bit about the transition from 
yeah, the swinging is great and it's a lot of fun, but maybe I need something different and that transition into exploring or finding Polly. It did. So I was in a committed relationship. Um, I'm not, it wasn't definitely wasn't monogamous, but again, like I just would go with the whole free spirit thing, but I would think sometimes it wasn't fair. How do I say this? It wasn't fair. So while well, I was with polyamory, when I discovered that there were you know boundaries you can put in place, discussions you would have. And so I'm pretty fluid, right? So with each individual partner, I'll kind of discuss what works best for them in regards to boundaries. And I can tailor my relationship to meet that need of theirs. Before doing that, I just was like, I'm a free spirit. Like, leave me alone. Don't question me. And so looking back, I think it was kind of unfair to some of my partners, um, especially because the majority of them started off monogamous. So they were attempting to shift their mindsets in order to to grow and, and progress with me. Um, so what I will say is transitioning over to polyamory, one, making me realize nothing is wrong with me. <laughs> like it's okay that I, you know, believe that I can love multiple people or connect with multiple people. Um, but also then doing the reading and the research and networking and realizing, okay, I can have these boundaries in place. Um, as long as I have the conversation, it's not necessarily affecting my autonomy and I can attempt to meet the need of my partners. But also being able to talk to them and educate them on that, you know, our time is a gift. The time you give me, the time I give you. And then there's certain things I'm just not required to do and just trying to get them on board with that. So I think it was great because it gave me some, I don't want to say guidelines, but it gave me something to work with, you know, and then it let me see that I may have not been as fair as I should have been to some of my previous partners. If they're listening, I'm sorry. I love you. Mwah. But <laughs> I'm doing what I can. do you remember? what it was like when you kind of figured out what polyamory was and what that, I guess, revelation kind of felt like? Um, It definitely was an aha moment. So I remember that show on Showtime, the polyamory dating show on Showtime came out. Okay. I already heard about polyamory and I kept thinking like, this is me. Like, I know this is me. But at the time, um, the person I was in a committed relationship with, I think he was okay with the sex with other people, um, but not necessarily relationships, right? Because other people kind of approached us with the poly thing and he shut it down pretty quick. And I used to kind of be like, yeah, I don't need that. Um, but I remember when I was starting to really read about it and talking to um, two really good friends who had recently came out as polyamorous on their Facebook page. I was like, this is so me. Like, I don't understand. And so I was trying to like drop hints. Like, I was like, oh, look at this show on Showtime. Watch this Showtime with me. Oh, you know, what you call it? They have like this meetup thing they're going to. We should go to like the meetup thing they're going to. And so it was like me inching him into it. Um, but for me personally, I was like, this, this is me. I remember when I told my mom and I said, Hey, I just want to make sure you know, I'm polyamorous. And she said, what's that? And I said, well, I just, I can date multiple people. I believe I can love multiple people. I can have connections with multiple people. And she was like, oh yeah, I couldn't see you any other way. And that was it. (laughs) I mean, I guess she grew up with you, right? Like, (laughs) she knows I love everyone. (laughs) (laughs) That's wonderful that she had that, that I guess, non-reaction maybe. (laughs) Yeah. I I don't too much have a coming out story for anything. For me being bisexual, poly, I just kind of figure, you know, people don't come out hetero. So why do I have to come out any kind of way? No one comes out monogamous. Um, but um, because I was at a place where I had some really established relationships and my parents had been around them and I was like, do they know who they are? And I didn't want to shortchange my loves. Like I wanted to be very clear. Um, me and my mom, we go to like the Olive Garden. That's our spot. We have conversations. And so we were talking. I was like, hey, I'm bisexual. And she was like, yeah, I know that. Like I've met some of your partners. I said, okay, I'm just making sure. And then when I dropped the poly thing, I couldn't see any other way. Okay, great. We'll pass the, the breadsticks and the salad. Let's finish our food. Um, and that's it. I mean, I, my dad told him and he was like, oh yeah, I know that. And then we went to the gun range after. Like that was it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's awesome. I, one, one thing I want to argue is that when you're at Olive Garden, you never finish your food. Because it's never ending, right? So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> never ending. <laughs> that's my that's my only argument with anything you said so far. Uh, <laughs> I I was wondering though, you you kind of you made it seem like well, you hinted that there were some maybe challenges when you you started to evolve into the polyamory and you were you were it sounds like you were very upfront with your partners about these are gonna be this is how it's gonna be. I'm gonna see other people. These are the things I'm going to do. These are the things I'm not going to do for you. And you sound like you lay it all out there. Were those 
did those conversations start right away or did it take you some time to learn that? Like, cause that's, that's pretty nuanced, uh, strategy. Yeah. Yeah. So I've, I've always been pretty transparent. Um, so, but I will say, I think the conversations evolved over time. Um, so it, it would start out with, Hey, this is, you know, kind of what I want to do. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to date people. Um, and I want you to go, you know, date people as well. Um, and that was okay. And then it was like, Oh, you know, I'm going to do an overnight. How you feel about an overnight? Like it was all these little check-ins. Um, and, and I will say that, that I struggled with a few things. So I'm a person who totally believes jealousy is a normal human emotion. I don't fault anyone for being jealous. I just feel like what it does or should do is maybe allow for some really good conversation on why I'm jealous or why you're jealous. And then what can we do about that? Is that only self-work that you need to do? Or is there something I can change in my behavior to help with the situation, right? And I remember I had a partner and he, um, he loves karaoke. He loves cigars. Um, he loves pool. I really could care less about the three of those things, but I always went, right? Cause that's, that's what he likes to do. I'm going to go. We started dating, um, a young lady and, um, she was into all three of those things. And so they would go do that, which is great. And we were in the car one time. He got an email and he got an invitation to a poker tournament at a pool hall he likes to go to across the street from a cigar bar he likes to go to. And so he was reading it and he's all excited about it. So in my mind, I was like, oh my God, I have to go to this. I don't want to go. And then he goes, oh, I'm going to ask so-and-so if she wants to go. And my heart kind of dropped and I didn't even want to go. But it was like, wait, he always asked me first wait a minute, how is he going to ask her? Like it was, and I, so I kept it to myself and I had to talk it out and like, what is wrong? Like, you don't even want to go. Like, why do you care? Right. Um, but that was my self work of, Hey, just because you've been with him X amount of years, doesn't mean that you're entitled to first right of refusal. It doesn't mean that he has to check with you first. Right. So there were a few like, and, and at first I was jealous, like, well, why does he want to take her and not me? But I didn't even want to freaking go. Like, <laughs> <laughs> didn't even matter. Um, yeah, it's not like something that you absolutely love to do too. I didn't want to go at all. But she wanted <laughs> like I, she wanted him to want her to go so she could tell him no. Right, exactly, and be Come like, take now. her. <laughs> <laughs> and so I feel like while I probably did not struggle as much as my other partners did, um, I don't want to act like I didn't struggle at all. Um, so yeah, the conversations definitely evolved over time. Um, I think I've always been very accommodating. I'm trying to work on that and not be so accommodating toward hindering myself, but my people are important to me. I love them and whatnot. So yeah, I think, and that's something that's maybe important to talk about is that always deferring to other people, right? It's, not taking care of yourself, the self-care piece of that. And maybe what is what has that looked like? And what have you been doing to build on that or maybe correct it in ways? So what it has always looked like is when I am dating someone and then we get to the point where we want to talk about entering a relationship, a committed relationship, and what that looks like for us. I always say I have two rules. Number one, don't have me out here looking crazy. And number two, don't tell me something. Don't let somebody else tell me something you should tell me. And that's all I say. And then I'm like, okay, what do you want? What works best for you? You know, is it, is it dedicated days? Is it you want to be informed if I sleep with someone else? Do you want to be informed if I'm dating someone else? Do you just want to be informed if I have another partner? And whatever they want, I actually would go with it. Then, okay, that's fine. I can do that. That's fine. Whatever. I have decided in 2020 <laughs> that that does not work for me anymore. Um, cause I feel like I have maybe allowed some things to occur that I might not necessarily be okay with, but as, 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 as open as and transparent as I am, I'm not very vulnerable. I'm not very share my feelings. I call my best friend. I bitch it out with her and then I feel better. Transfer of energy, right? So I actually started therapy since COVID's happened and I do therapy weekly. And my therapist and I are working on me setting boundaries or sticking to my boundaries. Some days this is very easy. Some days this is very hard. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, forget it. <laughs> but yeah, so that's what I'm doing to try to improve on that. Yeah. Wow. What a, I mean, a chance to use some of this maybe extra time do, with COVID to really work on yourself. That's amazing. Absolutely. Because I promise you, I would not go if I was still going in the office every day. I would have every excuse in the world why I couldn't make it. But she video chats me and I'm like, oh, <laughs> how can I say no to that? 
So yeah. right. Well, and there's also some forced boundaries now with with coronavirus, right? Like you're probably somewhat limited in who you can see, how often you can see them, and to some degree. So there's also or at some, least having those conversations. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 forcing some new boundaries in. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't, so I don't really do LDRs, right? It's never been, cause I like to see my people. And so I struggle. I had one LDR many, many years ago and like he lived in DC just trying to co- coordinate. That. It was, it was a bit much. Um, and so he, he ruined it for everyone. Um, so now I like local people. And so when COVID first started, um, I had two kind of titled relationships and neither one of the, those individuals had other local partners. And so we kind of created a bubble with ourselves, right? So I may have like two, at least two dedicated nights with one of, you know, with one of them and two with the other one. And then we would all get together at least one night a week and do like a game night or something. Right. So we kind of created a bubble to make sure we were limiting our exposure, but also still being able to engage um, with each other. Um, yeah. And that's outside. I mean, outside of that, we just, we weren't doing much. I think, Overall, I've stayed pretty, pretty like locked up away in the house, like not really seeing anybody. Um, I recently started talking to somebody new, so I see her, but yeah, that's it. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And I think that's, I mean, I honestly see that's where things are going to start trending is we're all going to create our little safety bubbles and have to assess risk you know, mm-hmm. continually. Yeah. Right? And you actually answered my next question, which was going to be what, what like your relationship structure looked like right now. And you just answered that. So, <laughs> so I did, didn't I? I normally say I have people I love and they, and I, I have people who love me and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> but like, okay, so I need to work on this though. Cause like today I opened my front door and there's a vase of handpicked sunflowers. I have no idea who they came from <laughs> at all. And I don't know what to do about it. Like, I'm telling you all about it. I don't know what to do. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're happy they arrived because we weren't sure if they were going to make it uh, all the way from up here. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. But like, I can't remember who knows I like sunflowers. And then I don't want to like think the wrong person and they get upset. So I'm just going to post on Facebook that I have these beautiful flowers and I love them. <laughs> We'll there see who hearts it. Right. I don't know. <laughs> right. There you yeah. go. That's that's your solution. So we could we could chalk this into the poly problems, right? This mm. is uh this isn't a problem. I guess I don't know. I guess you could have multiple admirers even if you weren't polyamorous. Yeah. <laughs> so I um have y'all heard of tiff treats? Do y'all have tiff treats, like the little warm cookies? I have not. No, that must be a <laughs> oh no. Oh my god. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So we're going to fix this. We're going to fix this. I got y'all. <laughs> so Tiff Treats, are, they come to you so warm. Their cookies are amazing. They have other things too, but whatever. We're focusing on the cookies. So I am a huge Tiff Treats fan. And um, at one point I had four partners. And I would get Tiff Treats a lot at work. And my associates were always trying to like guess who sent them to me or like who. Or if they, and I remember one time I left to go on lunch. And I have two different offices I left to go on lunch and one of my associates um, texted me. She said, hey, I'm, I'm walking back in the office. There's a Tiff Treats car for you. I bet it, you know, there's a Tiff Treats car outside. I bet it's for you. And I was like, it's a whole bunch of people that work there. Like, why do you think it's for me? She's like, I don't know. I've never seen anyone else get Tiff Treats. And lo and behold, I got a phone call and they're like, hey, we're here to deliver Tiff Treats. I'm like, oh. So I called her back. I'm like, can you go get my cookies, please? <laughs> And then she hid the card. It was like, I want you to guess who they're from. And I'm like, I do not want to have to fire you. Give me my card. I can't <laughs> thank I can't thank anyone if I don't get the card. <laughs> so maybe that leads into a different question of have you come to a realization of where your like your sweet spot is in terms of maybe how many partners is a good number? How many is maybe too many, not enough? Like to give those relationships what they need for you and the other person. Um, I think four was a lot. I think four was a lot, um, especially for local individuals. I think it was a lot. Um, but I loved them all and tried very, very hard to make sure I was fulfilling all their needs and still love them all, not past tense. And I was, and I hope I did. I, I will say that I felt like I was kind of running myself kind of thin because nobody can get like two days solely by themselves when it's four. 
I think two. I think two like is really really good. Three possibly if one's maybe a little bit less or a little bit more casual. I don't know, but I like I love me, and so I feel like I'm also my a whole partner of my own, <laughs> and so I have to add me into the mix. Yeah, and so that yeah. self care is important. Yes, I'm trying to do better with that. I've started painting and all the things. I like to like binge watch TV. I'll just turn my phone off. That's yeah. No, that's a. The phone is a time waster like no other. I think flipping it over, turning it off, and putting it away, you'll free up a lot of time just by doing that. Um, I try it sometimes, and then I'm like, oh, I wonder who's texting me. I wonder who's calling me. I wonder, hmm, that Facebook post I made. Ooh, Instagram. Oh, what's happening on Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> yep. All of those battles, right? <laughs> All the things. <laughs> so maybe back to Emma's question about what what is relationships, like what does your structure look like today? We kind of talked about you have roughly two, maybe three local partners, but how do you sort of identify in that? Like, do you, is it sort of like a relationship anarchy where everybody, you kind of said like everybody gets sort of what's best for them and what's best for you. You, or do you try to put people like, well, we all have to see each other two days a week or we all have to see each other. We have to even it out. And maybe clarify too, like, do you live with any of these other partners? I no longer live with any partners, um, which is, I'll be honest, has been a mix of things. Because first of all, I never wanted to live with anyone ever. But I can say I, I sometimes I miss that, especially with the kids, right? Having someone here. Um, I do enjoy having the king size bed to myself. I do enjoy things being the same way that I left them in my room. Um So mix, mix with that. Like sometimes it's like, yeah, I, I could do this. And sometimes I'm like, yeah. No, nah, I could I could nest again, so I'm open. I definitely would not say that I'm a relationship anarchist. Sharita likes attention, and I like to know where I stand in your life. And what I have discovered with individuals who kind of who love the RA, kind of identify with RA, is it, it, it tends to be that everyone's kind of equal, including friends. And um, I never can really figure out. Like I, I've met people who are RA, and I ask like, how many partners do you have, and they really can't answer the question. And so that works great for them. It doesn't work for me. So I wouldn't say I'm RA. I don't know if I'd say I'm solo poly either because I'm not against. Um, yeah, I, I was you know starting a business with one partner. I, like I said, I used to live with another one. So I'm not against living with anyone. So yeah, I don't know. I, so I will say at one point I did have a hierarchy structure. And I'm not anti-hierarchy. I'm anti people who don't let individuals know that they have a hierarchy when they start to date them. Um, cause that's important, right? I don't think I want to engage in a relationship that somebody else always gets to put their input in. Um, unless I'm like really casual with you and also, you know, feel the way about veto power, but that's not what we're talking about. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so I, I don't know if there's like a title for how I identify because I'm open. I just, I really just want to be happy. I want my people to be happy. I want the kids to be happy and I want to make all the coins. So however that looks. <laughs> <laughs> so make money, be happy and keep everyone happy. I like it. Oh, and have great sex. Can oh I yeah. That on the show? Okay, great. Well, but I mean, that's, <laughs> can you isn't say that, that on the show? Yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can say anything you want. Um, yeah. Well, I think that that plays into being happy though. Right. And keeping other people happy. That's a, uh, that's a key yeah. ingredient. It does. But I will say, so I mentioned earlier, I'm pro ho. And so I'm a very sexual person. Um, I was dating someone for a while who was um, asexual. Yeah. So my, my, my keeping her happy had to look a little different than it did yeah. with other people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's a great point. And it's, and that shouldn't be in my statement about that's a key ingredient. I think that's not necessarily true, right? There's a lot of people who have very, happy, healthy, fulfilled relationships where sex may not be a part of it. So that's a, that's a really good point. And I guess, would you be willing to talk about how you adapted to that ecosystem? I think I struggled. And, and the reason being is, is I never want anyone to feel pressured in any situation. And I didn't feel confident enough that she would say no to me if she didn't want to have sex. And so I always would let her initiate. Well, then we had a conversation where she felt like 
she was always initiating, which was very, very true. Um, but then she's like, well, it makes you feel like you don't want me. And so she wanted to feel wanted and desired. And I was like, I could have sex with you like every single day, you know, but because I know that that's not really in your wheelhouse. Right. So then she's like, well, how many times a week do you need to have sex for you to be satisfied? Well, I don't want it to be like you're checking the box. Right. And so I struggled. I would say I feel like we still had a you know, pretty good sex life, but I wondered how much of that was just because she wanted to make sure I was happy because she did say that she um, was concerned about not being able to keep me pleased. Uh, but we had great sex, like really, really great sex. So I just, I struggled. I, yeah. Yeah, no, that's it. I felt like I was letting her down and that I, I couldn't find the, the good, happy balance, like the meeting. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's a tough one because, and it's, it's, it's sort of interesting how it played out. Cause if, when you started that story, I was thinking that you were going to say that relationship, just, we didn't have sex because I got that need fulfilled with a different partner, but it sounds very much the opposite where you were, you were trying to find this like equilibrium, like how much sex does she have to give you and how little sick, little sex or how much sex do you have to give up? Like, where do you two come? Where's your crossover point? Yes. Yeah. And I don't, I just think that I just, I don't know. I was trying. I think she was trying. And I just think that was just a big issue because it was always a topic of conversation. I'm like, oh, I'm going to talk about this again. I'm, no, we don't have to have sex. I'm fine. <laughs> she was like, so damn fine. So I'm going to have sex like all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it seems well, it is, I'm sure, a situation that a lot of people find themselves in, especially if they're dating different people and Yeah, mismatched libidos. Yeah. Is, even if somebody's not asexual. Right. And yeah, and something else though. So um I have partners that I have really great sex with, but my connection with them isn't as strong. And then I have partners where if I was just like rating them, which I don't like to rate people, but if I was just rating them just on the physical part of sex, wouldn't be as high of a rating as another partner, but our connection is so strong that it is like the best sex because of where we are. So like I can, I can, I can have a mi- mixed match libido, right? But if I have this one partner, the dark connection is so great. Well, I want to have sex with you more because our connection is so, so great. So uh, although I can go over here and get it, I really, really want it with you though. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's the key is that, you know, you can want, I guess you can get your needs met elsewhere, but that doesn't mean that you don't also want it with that person. Right. Yeah. I want all the sex though. So. <laughs> <laughs> COVID is like messing up like whole summer, I swear. <laughs> well, I'm sure for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess I'm curious though. Now I'm nosy because it sounded like you had two, two partners, three partners, um, or you're starting to talk to a new partner and one would assume that it hadn't interrupt the sex or was there, I guess, did it look like those core partners plus additional, more casual encounters as well? You mean like during COVID? Yeah. Or pre COVID or in the absence of COVID. So pre COVID, um, so it's really weird. So I had, you know, I had a partner for like, you know, for like almost a year and a half by the time COVID hit. Yeah, we were like a year and a half, like January, when COVID hit, like March. I don't remember. I yeah. should know this. I feel like we've been in, I've been inside for like five months. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and so then, like right before COVID, is when I entered a relate. I had been talking to a girl, but we entered a relationship like in March, and then COVID hit in March, right? And I feel like COVID like changed the trajectory of our relationship. Like it just was so so fast, like. Because we were just spending all the time together. Um, like, for instance, I don't really let people just freely meet my children. But, but she ended up coming over here because where else are we going to go? <laughs> I can't, you know, I can go to your house, but I can't always be at your house. I've got kids, right? And so just her meeting my kids as quickly as she did, you know, this kind of thing. And so um, not that COVID is over because it's not over. But, you know, we have like masks and other things. I think I'm a... I said I was, so for like a month, I've been like, am I really open to meeting someone new, Right. And I've been like, oh, I don't know, because what if they have COVID, right? But what happened is I met somebody who also was working from home and social distancing with her and her children and like lives in my neighborhood. So <laughs> very close, <laughs> very close. And so now, you know, somebody knew. Right. But otherwise, I just, I was, um, 
I was at the store and I heard somebody say, excuse me. And I was like, they're not talking to me because people aren't talking to strangers during COVID, right? And he was like, excuse me. So I turned around and he's walking towards me with his hand out. And I'm like, stop walking. He's like, no, I just want to introduce myself to you. And I was like, stop walking. And he's like, what? What's wrong? COVID. I was like, we reported like a thousand cases today. You can't. He's like, why well, I just want to do And he had his hand out to shake my hand. I'm like, this is not going to work. Wow. He's like, oh, well, you can just give me your number. No, because you're not using common sense. Like, we're not going to mesh. It's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> like, People stand eight, out. eight, ten feet away from me and you can say hi. <laughs> right. And I will, like, holler out my social media or something. But don't, like, come and try to, like, shake my hand. Crazy. People are crazy. <laughs> So you have mentioned children a few times, and I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about how you handle um, having conversations around non-monogamy with your kids. Yes, I have kiddos. Um, Currently in my house, I have uh, two biological, um, one adopted, and two foster kiddos who hopefully will be adopted this year. Um, And I have other adopted kiddos that are gone, and then previous foster kids that have aged out that come back all the time. I just... I'm, I understand some certain people have perspectives of not telling their children. It's not their children's business who they sleep with. And, and that's fine. I respect their opinion. Um, my issue is I feel like you hide things that you're doing wrong. I'm not doing anything wrong. And I don't want my, I don't want my children to feel like they're doing anything wrong. And because I have teenagers and I was a teenager and thought I was doing something wrong. I thought there was something wrong with me that I wanted to date multiple people. And I was okay if somebody else dated somebody, like it didn't bother me. I wasn't trying to fight over him or fight over her, like other kids my age were doing. Right. And so for me, um, I want my kids, my kids know there are options. Um, so yeah, we, they, they know I'm non-monogamous. They know I'm bisexual. Um, it was really important for me for them to know, um, that this has a safe house. We are LGBTQ plus friendly. Um, and so I want them to then carry that over to school. And my kids are athletes are pretty popular. And I figure out, I can kind of figure how they act and people are going to, you know, mirror. Um, and so I need them to be okay and understand that this is fine. There's nothing wrong. If you have questions, come to me. Um, so we can, I can educate you properly. And so they're, they're fine. <laughs> they're, they're pretty good. They, um, they love me. So, yeah. Like you, you pretty much, you give them the information, educate them, but, and then obviously let them come to you with questions, but you yeah. don't make a huge deal out of it. That's, Mm-mm. I think that's, you know, and kids will, um, well, most of them are just like, you know, just want to, they'll come with you with questions, but they're like, okay, don't, don't, they don't see the big deal out of it. Right. I don't think it's a big deal at all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think because you don't make it a big deal, right? Like for me growing up, it would have been a big deal because it wasn't a model that we saw right. regularly, right? Or at all. Uh, right. So yeah. No, that's that's amazing. And again, I when you when you list off you run your own business, the organizations you're in, your multiple partners, five kids in the house. Yeah, I am blown away that you have time for uh, talking to us for talking to us and <laughs> and, and yeah. all the things you and all of do. the sex man <laughs> yeah all the sex yes do you do you sleep <laughs> so you i'm doing better with that with the self-care <laughs> i'm doing better i was not sleeping it as much before because i was always on the go right yeah. right now I'm, I'm home and i'm like yeah i'm going to bed <laughs> i'm out <laughs> That's good. Self-care is important. That's one thing we've covered this interview for sure. <laughs> yes, all the self-care and all the sex. Those are like the two key points. Of the <laughs> right, right. Well, on the on the note of self-care, sex, and maybe taking care of ourselves, the question of the sexual health, keeping yourself safe, and also your your physical health, right? If you're going and meeting new people, again, we're talking the pre-COVID, um, you know, you're out meeting new people, potentially people you don't know very well, like how do you keep yourself safe in all facets? So I I am very pro ho. I've mentioned that, but I am so pro STD checking. So I have a schedule, which COVID is messing with a little bit right now. But in March, I do a five panel, um, which is going to be your syphilis, your HIV, your gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, And then there's two types of HIV that they test for. And then in June, I do a 10 panel which is going to include all your hepatitis um, and then also HSV, both um, one and two. And then in September, I'm back to a five panel again. 
And then in December is when I have my annual women's exam. And so it includes like the full 10 panel, but then also includes um, a test for trichomonas um, and bacterial vaginitis as well as HPV. And so that's kind of my schedule. And so I was last tested in March because where I go to get tested in June is not open because of COVID. And so then I call my doctor's office. I'm like, well, let me try to get in with my OB. Well, they're only taking like patients that have to come in. And she's like, you just got tested in March, ma'am. Stop. It doesn't matter. This is my schedule. And so I think I'm going to go like, to the urgent care or something because I need, I don't like to mess up my schedule. <laughs> I like to get tested every three months. Um, I share my test results with my partners. Um, it's one thing for me to tell you. It's another thing for you to actually see it. I do not require partners I'm in and like established relationships with to show me their STD results. Um, but I think because I send them mine, they tend to send me theirs. Um, but when we first engage, I'm going to need to see something, <laughs> some kind of papers, um, just cause I have things to do. And so I need to make sure that we're all good. Um, I will say that I have done a lot of more research and I think at first I was very, oh my God, if anyone has STD, they're nasty, they're gross, blah, blah, blah. Um, I have matured, right? Um, you know, I think about if I kiss somebody, I can get strep or mono and nobody's like, oh my God, you got strep or mono. Um, and so if you do get chlamydia or gonorrhea, right? If you can take a pill, you're good to go. Um, yeah, you know, there's a lot of thing misconception, uh, misinformation out there when it comes to HSV. And I'm like, a lot of people have herpes and they just don't know they don't have it, right? And so it's a virus, just like you get other viruses. And so I think that polyamory has opened me to educating myself, um, which I was not doing before. I just was like, oh my God, you got something. Don't touch me. Don't come near me. You're like scarlet letter for life, right? Um, but that's just not the case. And so I'm glad I have kind of opened my eyes and read some stuff and talk to my doctor and, you know, realize that, oh, okay, you know, these things are not like death sentences. It's not that, oh, someone's nasty, you know, whatever. So. Yes. Yeah. No, well, thank you for saying that. Cause I think that is a huge common misconception is that if you have something, you're a pariah and nobody's mm-hmm. going to want to come near you. And by and large, like we've, we've met a lot of people who have had quite the opposite experience. They're like, I was so afraid to tell people. And then I told them and they're like, well, Here's what we're going to do to keep ourselves safe. Let's go have a good time and yeah. and party on, yeah. right? And it's so much better just being open and honest about it, and then in in receiving that information with grace too, and and figuring out how to um, move forward at everyone's comfort levels. Yes, I definitely want to be a soft space, right? I want people to be able to to say things to me and have this communication, um, and not feel like they're going to be judged or I'm going to like go crazy on them. Um, I remember I met a guy like a couple of years ago. Um, he was so fun. And so we went out to eat. Like the very first time we went out to eat and I was trying to explain to him about Polly because, you know, he was monogamous and um, he told me he had HSV. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and so we just kept talking. He was like, wait, did you hear what I said? And I was like, yeah, like you have, is it simplex one or two? And he was like, well, it's both. Okay, great. Like, I, can I have my Sprite and my chicken tender like we're eating? Um, it was not like a big deal to me. Um, and he just seemed so surprised that it wasn't a big deal. And I'm like, well, there are ways that we, if we do decide to become sexual at some point, that we can keep ourselves safe and we'll, you know, we'll be fine. Um, but he turned out to be crazy. So I had to let him go. So whatever. But yeah, <laughs> I was just glad that he, he said, you know, he, he said, you know, I do really, so I'm like an NRE junkie. I'm trying to do better with that. Right. But I have very, and, and this new relationship energy, I assume your listeners know, but I have very um, intense connections when I meet people. And if I have like this instant, like intense connection, I'm like, oh yeah, this is it. Right. And so he and I had had one of those. And then he just thought, well, let me let her know this, drop this bomb and she's going to be out. And no, no, I'm still floating on this NRE. I'm good. You know, um, but he couldn't get with the poly thing. So we had to cut it short. <laughs> <laughs> Have, yeah. you, have you had successful goes at the monopoly dynamic? <sighs> and I guess that's how do we define success, right? Where- that's what I was going to say. Like, how yeah. do we define success? Um, so there was a period of time that I only dated monogamous people. And it was not like on purpose, but I was so, and I am so active like in the, the Dallas poly scene. But I was like, yeah, I don't know if I want to date anybody like in the scene, right? So I would meet people like on Tinder or OkCupid, whatever. And 
I had a couple that I thought, you know, we had fun, we dated, um, we had good connections, we had good chemistry, but they all had this, like, I don't care about your other part of your life. I'm like a don't ask, don't tell situation. Well, if you don't care about the person that I'm, you know, living with and I have children and a family with, and so I can't really talk about them and I can't talk about, oh, something that happened with this part. It just felt like I had to exclude part of my life out, like it wasn't real. And so all those situations ended because I just couldn't deal with it. So I don't know, like during the time it was fun and I enjoyed it, but there was no longevity there. Right, right. I was just, and this this might seem accusatory, but I was curious if that really that monopoly dynamic works because as you've said, you like attention and you know, if you're dating somebody that's monogamous, you know exactly where you stand in that. Mm-hmm. So I, I nailed that. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> <laughs> all the attention I did. And cause they were only with me. Like I'd get all the attention. I was like, Oh, yay. <laughs> Uh, oh lord <laughs> love it i love it <laughs> you nailed it <laughs> look at that gold star gold star yeah, yeah i'm gonna get promoted after this episode i don't know what to but <laughs> uh, <for> the win. <laughs> awesome i was curious if you don't mind talking a little bit about the the physical safety aspect of it too not just the, the sexual health that although mm-hmm. that does impact your physical safety but you know meeting people out in I presume, you know, public or public spaces and keeping yourself safe. So you don't, yeah. Not in the grocery store. Yeah. Like, like, uh, <laughs> like the person that didn't respect your boundaries with COVID. Didn't respect my boundaries, six feet. Um, so generally speaking, I meet people and we hang out in public a lot. Um, I, I, so before COVID, I hosted like all the things like wine walks and taco Tuesdays and brunches and like, drag show brunches and, you know, all the things. And so I would like to invite them to those public kind of events. This way I can hang with you a little bit and go be hostess with the mostess and come back a little bit, right? Um, Sometimes that works well. Sometimes they felt like they weren't getting enough from me. So it would be like, oh, let's meet up and do like a movie or let's meet up and go for a walk. But it would still be public. It would be at nighttime, you know, where I'm like walking down the alley or whatever. Um, I have a best friend. She always knows where I'm at. Um, you know, if I have another partner, they probably know where I'm at. And then when I get to the point that I am going to go to like their house, um, you know, my, my best friend definitely has that address as well and, uh, gets a text when I get there and a text when I leave. I will say this is probably going to be kind of sexist. I have had a couple situations, um, one like in January, I think, where I met somebody for the first time at their house, but they were like a girl and, I'm like 5'10", and I like, I can fight. And so my thought process was, eh, she's smaller than me. <laughs> like, if it's an issue, I'll be okay. Um, but then it's funny because I would like chastise them. Like, I specifically chastised them when I got there. I was like, yeah, don't do this again. Like, what if, she's like, oh, I wouldn't do it if it was a guy. And I'm like, yeah, but bitches be crazy too. So don't, like, I'm not crazy, but like, don't do it again, right? So um, for their safety. So you too. showed up just as a public service, you know, to her. I'm trying to help her. <laughs> yeah, right. like I'm trying to make sure she understands safety protocols and that kind of thing. So. No, that's amazing. And I think <laughs> it's good to have each other's back. Right. And like you said, yeah, somebody shows up, they could be crazy. You don't know. Yeah. And, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. No, for sure. You never know. Should we do the blooper one? Well, you don't have to ask me. <laughs> <laughs> oh. are, you, are you ready to share maybe a, we like to ask, people to share bloopers and whether they can be sexual or not, but just some a funny thing. Well, she that, doesn't like sex. So it's probably not going to be a sexual. Ooh, that's the lies you know. <laughs> <laughs> but we like to basically demonstrate that it's not always as uh, maybe glamorous as it may. It seem. doesn't go flawless. <laughs> okay. So I want to preface this story by this is not recent. So this is like years and years and years ago. So no, like you, you were younger, no COVID. <laughs> right. I was younger, no COVID. Nobody current think it was them. But so I had this guy that I was seeing. And it, for me, it was just really kind of sexual, whatever. And so we got together. We hooked up, had some great sex. I was like, cool, I'm out. And me and my friend at the time, we hopped in the car. We go to Austin. And I'm going to Austin to see somebody else, Right. And so um, we get to the hotel, we stay the night, we get the next morning, we're kind of, you know, hanging out. Um, 
And I've been feeling kind of funny. I wasn't really sure why I was, how I was feeling kind of, I'm very, you know, into my vaginal health, but I couldn't quite figure out what was going on, but you know, whatever. Um, and so we're in the hotel and I'm with the, like the new person and we're kind of messing around and something told me like, ah, oh, you feel like you're feeling kind of funny. Like go to the bathroom, make sure you're good before like, you know, you get ready to get it in. Right. So I go to the bathroom, I, 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 I go pee, whatever, and I wipe myself and the condom from the last guy I was with comes out on the tissue paper. So the guy I was with, the condom fell off and he never told me. And so when I was feeling kind of like funny, it's because there was a whole ass condom in, inside me for like over 24 hours and nobody told me. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And so I was, I was like freaking out, but I was freaking out quietly because I'm in the bathroom of a hotel room with like another, another guy. So. Yeah, like you're trying to like be cool about it, but also not cool. <laughs> not cool at all. Then it's like, I want to tell my friend, I can't phone a friend. I'm in Austin in the hotel bathroom. And <laughs> now I'm like, oh, I got to take a shower. Just, yeah, yeah. So that yeah. happened. Yeah, I think then you have to drive back to like chew that other guy out. Like, what the fuck? The right. condom comes off and you don't yeah. tell her? Yeah, okay. I went the hell off. That I is, would, I would be. Excuse. I think it was on purpose, right? Because his excuse was like, "Well, I felt like you were going to see somebody else, and that way I would know." I was like, "Yeah, I'm done with you." So we were done at that point. Yeah. Oh. What was it? A it was a tracking condom. Like, how is that going to help him know? <laughs> I guess. I guess he was like, you know, if you go with somebody else, and they see the condom, they're not going to want to fool with you. You'll come back to me. He was another didn't like I was a free spirit kind of person. Oh yeah. my gosh. Oh. Yeah. So. Well. Good blooper. Sorry that happened. That's not fun. <laughs> I can laugh about it now. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So I have a an, another nosy question. And, and our show isn't typically like a raunchy sex podcast, but I'm just curious because you've you've talked a lot about how you love sex and you've probably had a fair amount. And I was just curious, is there something that you've never done? And it doesn't even have to be sexual, but something that you've never done that you've always wanted to do? And that you're like, can't wait to do it. I've never had a threesome with two bisexual men. And that's on and the bucket list? It is. So I, I'm bisexual. And so I think everyone should be. I just feel like it opens up like the dating pool for everyone, right? And so I feel like, unfortunately, um, bisexual men get like the short end of the, end of the stick. They You'll do. have like a lot of men who go, oh, there's no such thing as a bi men, right? If you like men, you're gay. And then you'll have bisexual women who it, it throws me for a loop who are like, oh, well, I don't like, you know, by men. And I'm like, how? Like, you sleep with women. Like, I I will call you out on Facebook in a group if you make a comment. And I'm like, but you, you like pussy too. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, and so I just, I, I do. I like by men. I watch by porn. Um, so that's something like I've never done. So I'm just saying, like, by men should hit me up. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's make this happen. Maybe yeah. uh, not during COVID, but soon. Not during COVID. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Well, I, I just, I was just curious. Can I? That's I, a good one. That yeah. was a good question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, is there anything else that you want to get out into the world and share with the world? And also, I wanted to maybe after you answer that, give you a little bit of time to talk about. The uh, things you do? Yeah, Poly <laughs> Dallas and Black and Poly and some of the other things and sort of what those organizations are and the benefits that, that they're really creating out there. Oh, awesome. Thank you. I think I would like to tell all women who have relationships with other women, if you are a receiver in the strap game and you and the woman break up, stop keeping our straps I have gone through so many dicks because me and women break up and they won't give me my straps back. And this is expensive. <laughs> and I'm just saying that you should give it back, especially because if you're a bi woman, I, I hear things like everyone wants me to get a new strap. We need to go together, get a new strap, get a new harness. Okay, that's cool. I'm down. But you're having sex with men who are using the same penis to sleep with all the women. So why do I have to get a new one? And if we break up, you keep mine. It's not fair. So <laughs> I feel like you give it back or stop making me buy new ones or buy your own. I'm just saying. Or give me some money so I can buy a new one. I need a fund. I should do like a Kickstarter or something. Like 
<laughs> to help women in my situation. <laughs> I was going to make a really bad joke, but I will not do that. Good. Ooh. <laughs> All right. I was going to say, here's what I was going to say. We'll call, it a, we'll call it a dick starter, not a kickstarter. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Uh, that is a bad joke. That it's is kind, a terrible. Kind of it's a, kind of a dad joke. That's a terrible dad. I like. I like dad joke. jokes though. <laughs> <laughs> this is hilarious. They, they are funny. But I think that is that's a crazy double standard. Anytime, and maybe I don't know if that's standard operating procedure in woman on woman sex, where by or strap on sex, like, do you have to come with a new one every time? I don't know. I, I think it's important, obviously, to come with a clean one. Well, but that's, why uh, does that have to be new? Like, that's <laughs> like, there's there's a dishwasher for a reason. Like, and I use condoms on it. Right. So, yeah, I don't know. I will say it's a fun experience to go because you get to pick out the size and girth you want and um, the color. I will say in the past, I've always done like pinks and purples and like, you know, whatever, right? And then my last um, female partner, we got a one that like matched my skin tone. You can tell me that wasn't my dick. Like I was so excited, <laughs> and I never knew it could be so exciting. So now I'm like, yeah, I'm team flesh tone on the straps now. Keep those purple dicks away from me. Um, so the, I, the experience is fun. So. Yeah, yeah. I have a really quick follow up question. Has just talking about sex toys. Have you? Has any of your children like ever come across your sex toys? And has that been an awkward situation ever? Oh my god. Okay, so <laughs> I had washed one of my one of my dildos, um, and then you know it had like the suction cup on it because you you know for the harness, uh-huh. and so I wanted it to dry, like air dry. I don't know why, but it did. So I stuck it on my bathroom like the, the counter in my bathroom and I forgot about it. And so, um, she was my foster daughter at the time. Um, she came to my room for something. I forget. She asked permission. She's in my bathroom and she was like, Oh my, what you and dad in here doing with this strap? And I was like, Oh yeah. You know, my friend, she left it in the bag and I, I put it there to take a picture of her so I could like mess with her. Like I didn't know what to say. Like I just had to, and she was looking at me like, Miss, please, mommy, you lying. You lying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she found my whole last dildo, and I just didn't know what to say. <laughs> it's probably like six, seven years ago. <laughs> so the question is, if it happens again, do you have a game plan, or are you going to stumble over it as just as bad as last time? So this time, I'd be like, what the fuck are you doing in my room? <laughs> now, I've changed my life. Like, I have a keypad to access my door. So how do you get in here? Don't be worried about my toys. <laughs> <laughs> that is probably imp- like you have your own space itself. That's this is your room is free to space. And that is yes. important. <laughs> I try to keep it a kid free zone, but I kid you not. So like I said, I have teens, right? And they're all teen boys. And then the little, she's like, she'll be seven this month. They will come all lay in this bed. They're all like six, one, six, three, six, you know, and they just come like lay in the bed while I'm working. And I, you know, so sometimes it's cute, and sometimes I'm like, get the fuck away from me. Like, I don't understand y'all are taking up my space, but otherwise, <laughs> I try to keep the kid free. Don't come in here. <laughs> uh, well, perfect. Good story. I yeah, like that. no, that's amazing. Well, uh, do you mind talking a little bit about Polly Dallas and Black and Polly and any other amazing work you are creating for the world, making the world a better place? Yes. So, uh, Polly Dallas Millennium, it will be our fifth year. Um, it is normally held the third weekend in July every year in Dallas. Um, but unfortunately due to COVID, like a lot of conferences, we had to can- cancel the in person. Um, so in November, it's November 6th or November 2nd through the 6th. Um, we'll be doing an online version of that conference where you'll be able to, you know, log on, see the speakers, interact with speakers. We'll have workshops. Um, so I'm the co-organizer um, with that, with uh, Ruby Johnson, um, who is the founder. So I'm very, very excited about that. It's going to be great. Um, and then hopefully by next year, COVID will be in a better place and you'll be able to come to Dallas um, and enjoy it. Um, Black and Poly is a um, national nonprofit and they are just what I like to call satellite you know, groups in different cities and we host quarterly meetups. Um, the Dallas meetups are popping. Like we've got like 40, 60, 50. I've had like really, really big meetups and a lot of it's new people. We have the, you know, the regulars always come and um, we have great conversations. I don't always do the talking because 
although I sound great, I don't know everything. Um, so sometimes we'll have like other, you know, speakers or therapists that will come in. We'll normally do about two different topics. Um, of course, right now we can't do in person. We're supposed to do one in March and that got canceled. Um, but we soon will have probably like a Zoom one online. And then I am the LGBTQ uh, plus site lead for my company um, for two sites here in the Dallas area. And so I sit um, on the Bi Plus Council um, advisory count, uh, advisory board council thing um, for the Out Equal Conference. And now if your company is not involved in the Out Equal Conference, try to get them in the Out Equal Conference. Um, it is where your company will send representatives and they will spend days. Like this year was supposed to be in Vegas. I was so excited. And now it's going to be online in October. <laughs> um, damn COVID. Um, but it's, it's really great. It, it, we have different topics and conversations about how your company can make people, you know, people in LGBT plus feel more inclusive. Um, but on top of that, there are round tables on polyamory and then bisexual and trans. And, and then there are serious like conversations and topics of, of uh, to help people learn. Um, so I think it's really great. Um, cause all companies need to be on board. So yeah. there's that. Awesome. Well, yeah, th- thank amazing. you for all that. Also, do you mind a little, uh, a few more details on what Poly Dallas is like? It's a, it's a conference, but what if somebody signs up or wants to be a part of it? What are they, what would they expect, uh, the, the event to be like? Absolutely. So, um, Poly Dallas Millennium is, of course, a, a polyamory conference. Um, we are definitely, though, going to center black and queer trans non-binary voices. Um, but it is a very all-inclusive conference. So you're going to be able to hear from individuals who are asexual, right? I touched on that. So at the last conference, I sat in a whole class about people who are asexual because I don't know anything about it. I'm very hypersexual, right? So I was able to you know, receive education there. Um, there's going to be uh, two key, I think it's two this year, two keynote speakers um, that are going to have a particular topic. Uh, our theme is open to love this year, right? And so we're going to have a lot of you know classes and workshops and around open to love. Um, you may have some speakers that are talking to you about dealing with your jealousy. Or you may have some speakers that are talking to you about having the poly, poly mono relationship. Um, so there's like a plethora of topics. There'll be two different tracks every day. Um, so you'll be able to kind of see like what classes you want to take. Um, we're going to bring in a family aspect to it, right? So, um, dealing with, with polyamory with your children and balancing that with, with, um, with multiple partners as well. Um, so it's a wealth of information. I'm pretty excited about it. Even if I wasn't like the co-organizer, I'd be really excited because I've gone to the conference before I was involved. <laughs> um, so it's, it's really, really great. It is. Yeah. Awesome. No, we Thank can't you. wait to join. And I, I would love to be there in person. Obviously, we can't right now, but mm-hmm. in the future, hopefully. I'll see you on video. It's like you're almost like you're here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's perfect. Well, thank you again for, I mean, for everything you do, for sharing your story with us. And yeah, it was it was super fun talking and, and learning a little more about you. Awesome. Thanks for having me. I appreciated it. I feel like I loved and stuff. Yeah. Well, you know where you stand with us. You're our number one, Sharita. Yes. Yay. (laughs) Have a wonderful rest of your night. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Welcome back. Oh, no, I messed it up. Yeah. We're back. We're back. (laughs) What you would think you would learn after 138 episodes. I know. Anyway, thank you so much, Sharita Marie, for coming on the show, reaching out to us, doing the panel discussion and this episode. It was lovely talking to you, and we're so excited to get your story out there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you, and we're excited to keep in touch, and hopefully we'll see you at Poly Dallas in November. Virtually. Other people who are thinking, man, I could really use some virtual conferences, check it out. Show notes are in the links below, or links are in the show notes, (laughs) whichever way you prefer. Uh, We did tell you at the beginning that we were going to talk a little bit about Patreon, so we're just going to quickly go through that, which if you're not familiar with what Patreon is, it's a way to support other content creators like us uh, in what we do. So you sign up, you pay, in our case, $2, $5, or $10 a month, and you get different levels of perks. But with all levels, you get to come to our video Q&A every month. We pull together uh, groups of people from the East Coast, West Coast, all over the world, 
and yep. we just chat and get to know each other, answer questions, help each other out, and it's our, been fantastic. Our next one is August 26th. It's a Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern, and again at 9 p.m. Pacific. We do two of these so that we can try to get everybody in different time zones to join. Yeah. If you want to learn more about all the different perks you can get and all of the amazing community building blocks yeah, that are available, sure, sure. go to our website, you know it, normalizingnonmonogamy.com, click on the community tab, and everything you could ever want to know will be under there. The other really quick thing I wanted to mention is we also have a women's group for $5 and up patrons, and our next women's group discussion call is August 12th at 7 p.m. Eastern. So again, like Finn said, you can go find all the information about that on our website, but I just wanted to announce that date real quick. Absolutely. And those have been awesome. The The takeaways that you've had from those have been really great. So oh, yeah. It's I've been, been amazing. That. The last thing we want to do is sit one more time, say thank you to Alt Playground for sponsoring the show. And we're excited to see what all those sexy mofos come, <laughs> coming in have to, what and they're the bringing to the party. Socials. And the swinger social. So uh, we're excited to, again, be helping them bring everybody a diverse way to meet other amazing people like yourselves. So check them out. And next week, come back. We have our regular, regularly scheduled programming, programming. Wednesday <laughs> Wednesday episode. This one's going to be with Sky and Cody. And it is another fantastic discussion, as they all are. Yes. And we look forward to seeing everybody in a week. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening. <laughs>